pity because you know, there's nothing like a story um, and literature has so much to give. Not only that, but there is so much literature. We, you could never get to the bottom of a literature, could you? I mean, you know, English literature or I'm sure Indian literature, uh, you know, there is, there is so much, but this whole sort of body of material sitting there and instead of using this wonderful material where we go and write, you know, sometimes rather silly stories, forgive me, um, uh, you know, and put them in textbooks. Um, <clears throat> but I think there, there is some movement, which I'm delighted to see, uh, uh, using literature again, uh, because it does have, you know, so many, um, so many advantages. Uh, right. So if we look at, you know, uh, why, well, uh, as I've already said, I mean, everyone loves a story. Even the rest of our lives, we spend a lot of our time listening to stories, don't we, on TV or, you know, uh, in media of various kinds, especially these days. Um, but I mean, you know, this has happened since the beginning of time. People have told stories around campfires and uh, you know, written them on cave walls and, and so on. And this has come down right until the present day, and including our children. Um, I mean, you know, I, I remember being read to by my parents as a child myself. I read to my own children, um, and these kinds of things sort of set up a, uh, you know, a, a bank of knowledge, a bank of vocabulary, and so on. And this is something they'll have for the rest of their lives. If we look at the advantages, um, well, there's so much vocabulary in literature. And this, of course, is you know, a basic essential for, for language. It was Wilkins, and I think this is a lovely quote, which I have used many times, but I use it because I think it sums it up so neatly. Without grammar, very little can be conveyed. But without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. In fact, of course, um, uh, you, know, well, you can often say a great deal just with a few words, even if you, know, you don't tie them together with correct grammar. If you're traveling, just one word is often enough to get across whatever it is that you want to say. Obviously, if you want to be more um, precise and more academic or whatever, um, well, you need, you need that. So it's not to say that grammar is not important. Of course it is. Um, I mean, you know, it's, if you're wondering, you've got me, Tarzan, you, James. I mean, but at the same time, even that has you know, personal pronouns and, and proper nouns. I mean, even that does have grammar. Uh, really, the moment you almost get beyond one word, you've got grammar. But the literature, uh, there's endless examples of grammar in use, and that's an advantage, I think, of literature. It develops receptive skills, um, if you're getting it by means of writing, either electronic or paper. Paper, of course, is uh, increasingly less if that's not an oxymoron, um, but it's um, but you know you, you it will help to develop reading skills. But of course, if it's oral, which a lot of our um, literature, a lot, a lot of our material is these days, you know, TV or whatever, um, it will it'll develop um, listening skills. I have noticed a few people who have written these kinds of ideas for anyone who might be interested in following it up, more than I will have time to do um, in this fairly short talk. But of course, this input then the students can use it to develop their own productive skills, writing and speaking and so on. And they can you know, use it to become creative and some some of our best students, of course, actually do become quite creative. But another really important benefit that I think we must not underestimate is the, the ability to do to develop a culture. Um, yeah, there's the culture behind the language. We're all culture bound to some extent, whether we realize it or not, we are. I mean, we were born into our own 
culture. And we just take it so for granted. We never think that it's going to, um, you, you know, that this has actually has to be learned. We learned it at one stage. I could think of a few examples, but I won't, get, won't sort of take up time now. Um, but, you know, the stories in this particular language, in English, or I'm sure in your own Indian uh, language or Indian languages, um, they, they, they have the culture in them, not, not just the language, but also the culture. But of course, culture is an important aspect of language, as I'm sure you, you all know very well. And so I've also included strategies in, um, in the title. Uh, you may be aware that, I mean, strategies is my own uh, basic field. Sorry, just let me take a... <coughs> Uh, my own PhD was uh, on strategies, and um, so I have defined strategies as actions chosen by learners for the purpose of learning language. That's for learners, now, especially uh, language learning. But from a teaching point of view, we could say that the strategies are actions chosen by the teacher uh, for the purpose of promoting uh, language learning. So that's what we do as teachers. And I, I, I think you are, understand that you are all teachers. Um, but something that I uh, work with with my own students now, and I'm, um, uh, as mentioned before, in uh, North Cyprus, which is you know, the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus, um, uh, using a, an integrated approach uh, to using literature to use an integrated approach. And I'd like to sort of talk about how you can use this, uh, and I'll give you, deal with an example in a minute, um, use stories or literature uh, to, to, to promote all of these things, yeah, speaking and listening, reading, writing, in other words, all four skills, uh, vocabulary and pronunciation, and grammar and comprehension. In other words, everything. Of course, in a, in, a, um, in a university environment when we're teaching, these are often sort of cut up into different sections. Uh, that is a matter of convenience as much as anything. Um, but when you are in a, in, a, in, a, in a school, in a classroom, you can do this, <clears throat> you can organize it more to, to include all of these things. And let's face it, they're all important, aren't they? I mean, we can't say any of these things are, are, are not important because they all are. And um, so I'd like to talk about how <laughs> uh, it's possible to put all of these into, you use a, a one story to do all of these. And so I thought I'd use, uh, the, 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 I, I think this is a delightful story, and I hope you agree, um, The Open Window by, by Saki. Do you all know it? <laughs> uh, it's a lovely story, and it's available on the internet. Uh, the, 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 what I will give you today is very abbreviated. And of course, you know, I hate having to do this because you cut out a lot of really nice things, but when you have to get it within a particular space, uh, maybe for distributing or whatever reason you, it is, um, you, you know, you have to cut it down. But I do try to emphasize to my students that if you enjoyed this story, go into the internet. After all, they use the internet all the time. Uh, why can't they use it for something like this? Uh, and read, you know, the, uh, the, the whole thing. Um, but, for today, I will give you a very abbreviated version. So, okay, what are the skills? I often start with um, with, with speaking. Uh, the reason for that is, if, if especially if you've got a quiet class, um, they don't always. It sometimes takes a little time to get them, you know, on board with your story. But giving them time to talk among themselves, exchange ideas. Um, that, that can help to warm them up and just get them to sort of think along the lines of the story uh, and to, to share their own existing, you know, their schemata, and I presume you're familiar with schemata theory. And um, 
So it's good, especially with a quiet class. Of course, you're the teacher. These things, I mean, what I say, I mean, these things don't always apply like this. Uh, with a boisterous class, shall we say, a noisy class, starting off with speaking can be a disaster because you get them chatting and talking and then they never be quiet. Um, so, but this is for you to the judge, you're the teacher and you know the things that work best with your students. And um, so even if I suggest something and say, this is what I do, it doesn't mean to say necessarily, this is what I think is right. Uh, it's for you, know, for you and yourself to do what, what is right for you and your students. So with this particular story, um, I use the question, have you ever seen a ghost, right? Uh, do you know anyone who has? And then I, you know, divide the class into groups, put them together. I like small groups at this point. You can give them pairs, but that's only two. Um, I mean, you use pair work for other things. But for, for this, it's quite good to have, you know, a, a small group, maybe four, six, something like that. Not too big. Or if it was too big, you find there are too many passengers. Um, but if it's too small, they just they've got each other to talk to. But actually, I mean, this question, it usually works well. I mean, everybody's got some opinion about ghosts, haven't they? <laughs> whether you, um, you know, whether you uh, believe them or whether you don't, and so on. Um, and, and so on. So you, that's, your, that's your speaking. Now, the next one I, I usually do uh, is the listening. So I... Uh, how, do, how does one do this? Well, uh, well, a way that I find, I mean, bear in mind that these are just suggestions. There are lots of different ways. Uh, but I find this quite convenient to sort of you know, find some extra information somewhere. And you know, the internet is full of information. And maybe about the author, for instance, about Saki, his real name. Now, this is what I would read them. This is just a small text. Um, his real name was Hector Hugh Munro. That's his birth in when he was born in 1870 to 1916. Well, he was born in Burma, sent to England to be educated, later became a journalist. Start of World War I, he joined the army, was killed in France. Uh, he never married. He is considered a master of the short story and the open window, maybe his most famous. Okay. So then you've got, you know, while you're reading, they've got these questions in front of them and they are uh, trying to answer them. If that's too difficult, you just can give them true-false um, uh, answers. All they have to write then is T or F. This is actually, this reduces cognitive load. So if your students are struggling, or if they're not good listeners, it may be easier for them to write it as, you know, um, you know as true-false. Uh, so you could say, you know, uh, uh, Saki was born in England, for instance, and of course the answer then is just if, that's all they have to write, it makes it easier. Again, it's for the teacher to, to decide uh, the best way to handle it with your particular students. But there is an extremely, sorry, oops, it is extremely important management thing. And I don't know, I, 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 I say this to my you know, student teachers again and again, but they somehow often, many of them do not take it, get this in, <clears throat> that you must do the listening, you know, do the, you know, read it or however you're going to do the, the text, but before they can see it. If they can see it, <laughs> they will read. Even if you say not to, they will, or at least quite a few of them will. And then it's not a listening exercise at all. It's a reading exercise, okay? But I don't know how often I say this to my own teacher trainees. And that's the one, uh, that's the one they seem to find hardest. So you have to find some way of keeping the listening text back. Uh, when you give them the other, don't, don't give them the questions and the text together, because then it's just a reading exercise. Then there's uh, a select a few words from the text, ones you think they're not going to know, um, such as, um, in this case, just half a dozen of them, more twilight, physical, heel, cemetery, grave. Um, 
and you can get them to do different things depending again on the, uh, depending a lot on the time that you've got if you've got able to spread this out over a week for instance well you've got time to be a bit more you know uh, go into it in a bit more depth um, but unfortunately yeah, teaching experience is that we're always short of time but you can um perhaps yeah i mean you can get them to write see you know just look for um meanings or for synonyms for antonyms to write sentences with them or whatever it is that uh yes um, forgive me for having depend <laughs> uh a, a turkish sh has has uh depending sorry about that i must uh, it has, has, has sneak. I must remember to correct that next before I use this again. Um, anyway, but I of, often use the same words for pronunciation uh, because it then gets you know, those two done at the same time. So you would look at the words that you think your students might have um, problems with, such as maybe the pronunciation of things like L I G H T, how that is pronounced in English, light, not like a hit of or whatever. Uh, PH, of course, is F in English, it's Greek originally. Um, and maybe number six with the uh, consonant blend, sometimes with some students from some places, that's a problem. Uh, so whatever it is that's a problem for your students, make sure that they, you know, you get them to practice it and that they're given a, a good model of what, what it actually should be. Um, so, and then there's the reading, and I'm sorry, I'm also just I'm off to the side watching my clock. Um, yeah, there are different ways you can handle this, and I don't know there's, what, what's best, I'm not sure. Uh, you can, the, the teacher can read it, and students read along and, and listen. Some, you can get a rare version of it on the internet and play it uh, in class. That saves your voice. It also is, it cuts down teacher talk. You can get the students to read it silently. The big problem with that one, I find, is that students read at very different rates. And so it's you start off where they're all starting, but then you, you know, so some are finished very quickly. Others are still, you know, plodding through it uh, when the others are finished. So it's a matter of timing for number three. But well, you can, and some people do. Or you can get them to read uh, aloud. Either uh, they can volunteer, you can do it in turns. Uh, I think I suppose I was find it quite good actually because it gives them a bit of speaking and a bit of pronunciation practice as well. And so I'm going to read through this very, very quickly because yes, my aunt will be down soon, Mr. Nottin said, the young lady. Do you know anybody around here? Hardly a soul, frankly, not replied. I was sent here for a nerve cure. Doctors have ordered complete rest and absence of stress. Ah, then you don't know about my aunt's great tragedy, the girl went on. Three years ago today, her husband and two brothers went off for a day's shooting with their dog. They never came back. They were killed on the moor, but poor aunt thinks that one day they will return. That is why she leaves the window open. And of course, this is you know, the title, the open window. Frampton shuddered as the aunt bustled into the room. I hope you don't mind the open window, said the aunt cheerfully. My husband and brothers will be home soon and they always come in this way. They have been out shooting and the doctors insist I must avoid physical exercise, interrupted Frampton, who was sure everyone was interested in his condition. And on the matter of diet, ah, here they are now, cried the aunt. With a chill shock of fear, Frampton could see three figures walking across the lawn in the deepening twilight. They carried guns under their arms and a dog was at their heels. Horrified, Frampton grabbed wildly at his walking stick and hat and rushed out the front door, down the drive and out the gate. Oh, who was that? Asked the aunt's husband coming in through the window. Oh, a most extraordinary man, Mr. Nuttle, replied the aunt. Could only talk about his illnesses and he dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. 
One would think he had seen a ghost. Now, this sort of leads to you know, the, 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 the speaking topic that I gave them at the beginning of this. He told me he had a horror of dogs in these. He said he was once hunted into a cemetery by a pack of dogs, and he had to spend the night in a newly dug grave, enough to make anyone lose their nerve, I'm sure. Romance at short notice <laughs> was his specialty, which actually has become a saying, almost an idiom in English. Um, romance at short notice, yes. So I didn't, this is a lovely story. Don't forget that it is, you know, the whole thing is just on the internet quite freely, or perhaps you already know. And um, so that's the story, how could you choose? And then we need comprehension. Do, do they understand it? Um, again, there, there are choices. They can do it quietly on their own, in pairs, in small groups, or however, or homework if you run out of time. Um, but perhaps something we need to be aware of is that, uh, especially with more advanced students, it's good to ask some questions which require inferencing. In other words, the answers are not directly in the text. I mean, the first five questions are, they're there in the text already. Why was Frampton there? Uh, we already know he was there for a nerve cure, okay. But when we get down to number six, why do you think the niece tells these stories? I mean, the answer to that isn't actually in the story. So students have to, you know, think of it beyond just what they're told and um, that's related to other people they know and, and this kind of thing. And so, but actually the more advanced the students are, the more the kinds of questions like number six should be included in, your, in the work. Grammar, well, again, different ways of doing it. Uh, one is to just take words from the text and put, uh, get the students to put them into a different part of speech. So he is a very interesting, uh, the word people is in the text, but of course, in order to make it grammatically correct, he is a very interesting person, etc. So I've got just six of these here as examples, but of course, a much better way in a real classroom is to actually include whatever it is you have already been doing in the class, uh, whether it's past tense or future tense or what, whatever it is, uh, or adjectives or comparatives, or whatever, and to use words from your know, vocabulary from the text and to build it into a grammar exercise that way. Writing, I, I tend to do writing for homework. Um, unless there's some special reason for doing it otherwise. Uh, special reasons might include, for instance, if they're preparing for an exam and they have to learn to do it in a set time frame. Whereas, of course, at home, you have no idea how much time they spend on it. Um, but generally, uh, uh, they do it at home and bring it in. Also of Frampton's nervous condition, they have to sort of, um, in, you know, one again, inferring from what they are told um, and imagination, get a bit creative. Line. They can also do a, a sequel. Um, what happened after the story? Where, did, where will he go? Um, what will he do? Uh, who will he meet? What will happen to the girl, et cetera, et cetera. So they can spend, use their imagination to write, um, you know, another, uh, uh, another story. Um, but of course, um, uh, th this was a short story. Short stories are good in the language classroom simply because they are short uh, and you often don't have too much time. <clears throat> that, that's not to say that's the only thing you can do by any means. You can use folk stories or children's literature, older, you know, or te teen literature, which is a genre in its own right these days, non-fiction, non poetry. Poetry is underestimated in the language classroom. But students often don't relate to it all that well because they think it's not real language, if you like. But well, yeah, it depends. Uh, sometimes you can get away with it, sometimes not. Drama, or the novella or novels, science fiction, fantasy, all of these genres can be. I've actually been working on a, um, 
possibly publishing a book uh, of, you know, of material that I do actually use myself in my own classes because I mean I teach this subject um, in you know, literature and the language classroom. And, um, and I include all of these genres uh, because I think they can be interesting, they can be fun, and fun is important. Concluding thoughts, um, and actually I'm looking at the clock, I think I, I feel quite happy that I've done quite well to get through. Yeah, so we should remember that a class um, where literature is being used to teach language is not exactly the same thing as a literature class. Um, although there are obviously going to be some similarities and some overlaps. In the latter case, the class is focusing on the piece of literature and is likely to be much more you know, intensive. But in the case of a language through literature class, the focus is on using the literature as a strategy to develop the language. So the emphasis is likely to be much more uh, extensive. And I do encourage my, try to encourage my students to read as much as possible. Um, it is rather unfortunate that actually people, I'm sure you, you have heard this said, and I think it's at least partly people don't read these days. It's a big pity um, because it's a wonderful way. I mean, it's wonderful fun in its own right, but it's also a great way to develop language. Um, and so from a teacher's point of view, based on it, you know, if we can provide an integrated approach, uh, that not, almost nothing else can actually match, quite honestly. You can do all these things. From the learner's point of view, it can provide an enjoyable and motivating way to expand vocabulary, to learn grammar rules, how they're applied, and to provide a model for other skills, especially writing. A major bonus is that it provides a window on the, ta on the target culture, and that is important. So the potential for using literature in the language classroom is limited only by the teacher's imagination yeah, and creativity and time, of course, uh, and their knowledge of the students and the students' own preferences yeah, and the time available. It does take time, but can I suggest that it's the kind of thing, I mean, I myself do precisely this, that it takes time to, to, to write it and to, to get it right. But then you build a bank. And so after a few years, you've actually got a really, you know, good bank of stuff that you can use, you know, year after year. And of course, you never use it quite the same way, or I don't anyway. Um, but it's still there as the basic material that even though it takes you time initially, it is an investment, if you like, um, for future classes. So thank you for your attention. And I hope you've gained something interesting and useful from the talk. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, or if you have any comments or questions, uh, please, you can contact me on, this is the best uh, email to get me on. This is my own email. Um, I, I do have a, uh, I one at the university as well, but frankly, this is the one I check the most. Um, yeah, especially at the moment. Um, and right, thank you very much for your attention. And I think I've got through it 